Hi, my name is Chris Garlock. I'm the host of the Union City Radio and Your Rights at Work shows on WPFW 89.3 FM in Washington, D.C. I also host the Labor Radio Podcast Weekly and Labor History Today Podcast. Check out my shows and all the great shows on the Labor Radio Podcast Network. You have the right. That's right. And a whole bunch of other rights. You are listening to Your Rights at Work. Chris Scarlock here with Ed Smith. And this is WPFW's call-in show about your rights on the job, the ones you have, the ones you don't have, the ones you wish you had. Dear friends, welcome to the Labor Radio Podcast Network Series, highlighting the work of network members. The growing network of over 70 shows in four countries serves as a one-stop shop for audiences looking for labor content, and as a resource for labor broadcasters, podcasters, and content producers. My name is Evan Papp, and I produce Empathy Media Lab's podcast on labor, political economy, arts, and culture. And we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. So, Chris Garlock, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what led you to organize labor. All right. Well, I'm originally from Berkeley, California. My dad was active in the free speech movement back in the uh, early 60s, was uh, teaching there. And then I grew up mostly in upstate New York, a little town called Rochester, New York. And my dad was a labor historian. And uh, so I really got a lot of exposure to labor history and working people growing up. I trained as a journalist and in my whole career, I sort of bounced back and forth between uh, being a working journalist a, as a reporter and the managing editor for muckraking paper in Rochester called the Rochester Patriot and, and working in the labor movement, usually doing communications or mobilization, which are kind of the same thing. And that's where I find myself now working for the uh, Washington AFL-CIO Labor Council here in Washington, D.C., but doing communications and mobilization work. And I spent two years after I uh, left Rochester about 20 years ago doing radio with Jim Hightower in Texas and really got bit by the, the radio bug at that point. And so here in D.C., I got involved with WPFW and uh, I host a weekly show called Your Rights at Work. It's a call-in talk show. People call in with their issues about rights on the job. It's co-hosted with Ed Smith, who's a labor lawyer. And the problem that we found is that people tend to think that they have rights that they don't have, or conversely, they tend not to know about rights that they do have. And in almost any case, it's almost always better to be part of a union <laughs> than, than not. So, And then I got into uh, podcasts uh, in the last few years, and that's that's been a real interesting learning curve and challenge. Well, you touched about it a little bit, but there's a lot of people who are coming up and weren't raised in unions and may not be interested or aware of labor news. Could you talk a little bit more about why you think unions and organized labor are important and should be covered more? So the thing about unions is that depending on how you ask the question, folks tend, thanks to a, a decades long war on the labor movement by the bosses, people uh, know that if you try and organize a union, you're liable to get fired. And, and, and not, even if you get a union, you're not going to get a contract. If you get a contract, it's not going to be honored. Uh, so it is very, very difficult to be in, in the, the labor movement in this country. Conversely, people know that folks in the labor movement are paid better and have better protections and a better quality of life. My dad always had a real simple sort of, of way of looking at things. He says, either, either people work for you or you work for people. If you're not sure what class you're in, just think about it that way. So if you got people working for you, then you're almost likely, most likely a boss. But most of us don't. Most of us are working for somebody. And that means that we're workers. And if you're a worker, then whether you're in a union or you're not in a union, you have common concerns with workers of all different kinds, whether you're in the building trades or industrial or public sector, doesn't matter. And we hear this all the time. People tend to think, oh, I'm the only one facing this. Uh, and they don't even talk to their own coworkers, much less people in other uh, trades or other industries. So to me, it's really not so much, I love the labor movement. I've worked in the labor movement for many, many years. 
but it's really more about the labor movement in terms of workers. And workers fight back in all kinds of ways. I mean, yeah, they form unions, but they do all kinds of other things as well. Fight for 15 is a good example. It's backed by a union. And it's really a ground swell and a grassroots movement. Uh, and it's been that way uh, forever. I've been doing the Labor History Podcast for a couple of years now. And one of the reasons that I started doing that was that I realized, particularly in a time like this, when we're facing so many challenges, we don't know our own history. When I'm mean, talking about we, it's not just a labor movement, but we as workers. Workers have this tremendous history of fighting back against bosses in this country and around the world. And the reason that we don't know our history is because it serves the interests of the bosses. <laughs> if, if the bosses, if we know that people like us have been fighting back, oh, and winning, it might give us some ideas. And so we don't get taught about it in school. We get a few plaques or uh, memorials here and there, but not, not that many. So it's, it's not even a conspiracy. It's just that why would you tell people there's a history of fighting back if they would fight back against you? I get it. Could you talk a little bit more about your many shows? Because it's not just one show that you're doing. You, you've been working on a number of shows and you're producing a number of shows uh, today. So uh, Union City Radio is now it's seven days a week. We, we work five days a week. And then once the pandemic hit, we picked up the weekends as well. It runs three minutes during drive, well, what used to be drive time, <laughs> 7.15 in the morning, seven days a week on WPFW 89.3 FM in Washington, D.C. It's the, the Pacifica station here in Washington. And it's basically an audio version of a very popular newsletter that we put out at the Metro Council called Union City, which comes out five days a week. And that's just a roundup of all the sort of labor news that's happening in D.C. And with 200 affiliated locals, somebody is always doing something. And if the locals aren't, which they are, there's 50-some there's internationals in town. So something is always happening here in Washington. So we then take that and turn it into a three-minute uh, rundown it includes what's on the labor calendar for the day. It also includes a little bit of labor history, which I'll come back to that in a second. So, that, so that's uh, Union City Radio. Then there's a weekly show called Your Rights at Work, which I co-host with Ed Smith, who's an executive director of the DC's Nurses Association. He's a labor lawyer. It's a call-in show. It's really about your rights. It's really about worker rights. And as I mentioned earlier, what I know from just from many years of being in the movement, people will call me up at the labor council and they'll be all upset about something that's happened to them. And they'll, let, they'll be like, the boss can't do that, can they? And I'm like, well, technically, yeah, that's actually, it's, it's immoral, it's wrong, they shouldn't do it, but what? it's perfectly legal. But on the other hand, oftentimes people are not even aware uh, that, that something that the boss is doing is illegal. And while we're talking about it, the main thing, by the way, that you should always do, according to my labor lawyer co-host, document, document, document. That's the thing we always tell folks. So, you know, we have a lot of fun. We do a lot of interviews, too. We have people in the San Francisco Mime Troupe has been doing a great series during the pandemic that we've picked up and we've run with that. So we, we interpret our mandate fairly broadly, but it's a, it's a, it's a call-in show. People like to call in and, and talk about their rights on the job. So there's that. And then right after uh, Trump was elected, when all of us were trying to figure out how did this happen and how are we going to survive, again, part of my thought was we need to have some perspective. Trump is bad. The things he's doing are bad. I lived through Nixon. Uh, I lived through the Bushes. And I know a little bit about the history, labor history, when people who organized were killed and jailed. And so I thought we need some perspective here. And the other thing, the cool thing, labor history is just amazing. It's got battles, it's got struggles, it's got victories, it's got defeats. I mean, you could do a whole TV series and never run out of material. And I knew this actually, because in our daily newsletter, Union City, when we do surveys, you know, we work really hard to get all this really great news. And the thing that ranks number one by far is this little labor history stuff that I put in just for filler at the bottom because I like it and people love it. And I think 
that the reason people like it is that when you're in the middle of the kind of fights that we have in the labor movement, where victories are few and far between, and you can't always see what's going on, you can't get the perspective. When you see labor history, you get that you get that perspective, and you realize that the fight that we're having now over healthcare, for example, this is a fight that has been going on for years. You know, I give you another example. There's all this hubbub over the appointees to the Supreme Court. It's awful. It's terrible. I'm totally down with that. But let me just remind folks, the Supreme Court has never been a friend to organized labor. Okay. <laughs> the organized labor has had huge problems with the Supreme Court. So once you have that perspective, I think it kind of helps to, to deal with the things that we're in. So that was the idea of labor history today. And that's why it's called labor history today. In this country, we tend to like our history in the past. People will always say, oh yeah, well, unions were good in the past, but we don't need them today. Or women got the vote, so it's all good now. Blacks got the vote, so it's all good now. And ask labor, ask women, ask people of color. The struggle is not over. And so when we do the Labor History Today podcast, whenever we talk about labor history, we always connect it to what is the struggle going on now? And it is never uh, much of a jump to connect something that happened in 1830 to something that's happening in 2020. So I think those are all my shows. <laughs> and, and the idea of, of history, I, I think it's important to this concept of current history is, is also related to past history that's related to future history. And, and history is this, this beautiful continuum and, and right. it does give us strength to remember our roots and where we came from. But you are forgetting one thing that is you're going to be working on tonight that you're going to be showing with the DC Labor Film Fest. Of course. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. I always love talking about the Labor Fest. So, so when I was in Rochester, we, we started a thing called the Rochester Labor Film Festival. It's actually, it's probably the oldest labor film festival in the country now. I think it's coming up on, on 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll tell you a quick funny story about that. When I was a teenager, I loved, loved movies. And there's a place called the Eastman House, the Dryden Theater. And they showed old musicals and dramas. And just they have, to, they have this whole film collection there. And they showed them like five days a week. And so every night around dinner time, I'd be getting ready to head out. My dad, who thought movies were a waste of time, be like, where are you going? I don't know to the movies and he just really he was of a you know, generation that just you should be working or reading a good book and so that was that was one of those we all have struggles with our with our parent is it that was that was mine but the, the great coda to that story is that years later we worked together on the Rochester Labor Film Series because my dad discovered films about labor and realized that there's a lot of people that are never going to come to a picket line. They're never going to come to a rally, but they love movies. <laughs> and there's a lot of people who do go to picket lines, but who also like to go to movies. And that movies are another way of mobilizing and educating. And, and it's a great place, especially during the pandemic. We've been doing stuff on Zoom. And people love this opportunity to get together, particularly when the way that a lot of us see each other is on a picket line or at a rally or at one of the interminable union meetings that we all go to. And it's just nice to go to a movie and then chat about it afterwards. And so started the Rochester Labor Film Series. When I came down here to D.C., Tony Mizaki, actually, who is a whole other backstory to Tony Mizaki, folks know about him, but... He, my dad brought him up to Rochester to introduce Silkwood and he came back to DC and he's like, how come we don't have a labor film series here in Washington? So uh, we started one here in Washington. This was our, I think this was our 20th year that, since that happened. And uh, so we've been doing it 20 years here in DC. We do it at the American Film Institute and a bunch of other locations. And then about, I want to say six years ago, we broadened it out to become the DC Labor Fest. And we do labor themed music and we do labor themed history tours. We, we've done a trivia night, almost any cultural thing that has to do with labor, we have done it. This year obviously was a challenging year. We couldn't do any of the other things that we do, but we did take the film series online. And in fact, we normally have a once a month screening during the year, just sort of keep that going. We've actually been screening labor films pretty much every week 
we just figured people needed someplace <laughs> and something to do. And frankly, we've got a lot of labor films that have been made available to us. And so that's been really, really special. I, it's other than our labor radio podcast uh, network meetings, which we'll talk about in a second, but those weekly get togethers of the, the labor film folks. And the cool thing about showing them online, we've had people from all over the world that have, that have you know, shown up. At our, at our online film. So honestly, even when we're able to get back in person, I'm pretty sure we're going to keep going with the online film screenings. It's, it's been like so many other things, it's taught us some things that uh, we didn't know. And some great discussions. And you've been able to also bring in some of the directors and producers yes. and uh, really just you're, you're continually building solidarity. So that kind of brings me to the, the next question. As the founding member, can you talk about how you founded the Labor Radio Podcast Network, and could you talk about why you think this network is important and others should take a look? Absolutely. So again, just through the work that I've been doing, having the, the radio shows on WPFW, and then as a, like, as a couple of years ago when I started the, the podcast, and I just realized that podcasts, A, just a lot of people listen to podcasts. The numbers are just staggering. But then also... To get on PFW, I had to pitch an idea to the station manager and show that we'd have audience. And you got to sell it to somebody who has a radio station. You know, the entry level for doing a podcast is ridiculously low. This is one of the great things about capitalism and technology. Is it, is, it has put the tools of production, as uh, good old Karl Marx would have said, right in the hands uh, of us workers. And so I realized, like when I got the idea for the Labor History Podcast, I'm pretty sure I couldn't sell a labor history radio show to anybody. It, it's, I'm sure there's an audience for it, but I, I just, I think that would be a tough sell, but I didn't, I could, I could just start a podcast and, and we actually got, you know, some sponsors. So just in doing the radio shows and then getting into podcasts, I, I just started, started finding out about there was there's somebody in Kansas City who's been doing a show for 20 years. There's folks up in New York City that have been doing the shows. Steve Zeltzer out in California is doing a show. So we just sort of started to find each other. And I had a little bit of experience networking because I also had built a, a global labor film festival organizers but it was the same idea where we, where we had people who were also doing labor film series around the country. My dad does one in Rochester. Steve Zelser does one in San Francisco. There are people in Italy. There are people all over Europe doing them. We actually did, for five years, we did a conference. We would bring together a few dozen of us just to meet each other. Where are you getting your films? How are you raising money? How do you bring people in? How do you deal with this problem? How do you deal with that problem? And it was just, it was just useful. It was just useful to find other people doing the same thing that you're doing. And we start, oh, we found a great film. And, and so we'd share films or share, you know, oh, don't get that director. They're a pain in the butt or whatever, whatever. And so I had that experience and I knew that this was a useful uh, thing to do. And I also knew, frankly, the, that the reason that it's the Labor Radio Podcast Network rather than organization or anything more formal was that we're all pretty independent. <laughs> all the film festival organizers were independent. All of us doing radio and labor radio podcasts, we're all independent. None of us want to be told what to do by anybody, even our bosses. <laughs> You know, you know, but I knew the value of a network. My original idea for the film festival organizers network was, look, let's get a bunch of us in one room and probably good things will happen. And that was true. So that was the idea in early 2019 was let me reach out to these folks that I know of. And at that point, the, the technology was to do a conference call. And so we did a few conference calls the conference calls kind of went okay, but the conference call is as it's it's not a great medium. It's just it's not, uh, and I don't I didn't really know why. Now I know why. Having done Zoom, you can't see people, and there it turns out even though seeing people on Zoom is not the same as being in the room, and there's good things and bad things, but the conference calls just were were not that useful. So we did a few of them. But the network 
then existed. I had a list of the shows. The AFL put it, the AFL had started a podcast. So they, they put the list on their website. I put it on my website. So we had this network that kind of existed, but it, it wasn't really doing much. When the pandemic hit, Harold popped up. Harold is an actor up in, in the Seattle area, and he all of a sudden had a lot of time on his hands. Plus, Harold on the side does websites. And he said, you, this list that you have is really not that useful. You really need a website with lots of clickable links. And I said, Harold, I will raise the money for it if you will do it, because I know how to do it, but you obviously have the skills for it. And so he built our fabulous website, which you have put a map on recently. I, I came up with a grid idea that, that so you can see all 70 shows right there at one time, but Harold was the one who figured out how to implement that. And then Harold is a huge social media maven, and he's the one that just really got us on the map with the social media. And the other key thing besides Harold coming on board was that we started using Zoom for my work locally, and so I thought, let's host a couple of Zoom meetings. And they just took off and people really enjoyed meeting each other. And all sorts of interesting things started to happen. People started hosting each other on each other's shows, right? People started emailing us and asking if they could be part of the network. And so this idea of this sort of loose affiliation where we've got a club, that's where it took off from there. We have a guest database, which I had built because I needed it because I've been doing shows for years and I'd be trying to remember who was that great guy I had on three years ago. I can barely remember his name, but I remember what we talked about. So I have this guest database that we built. We have a shared resources drive where folks can post. And this has really been something I've been using a lot lately. Somebody will get some great audio from a picket line out in Seattle that I never would have got and I get access to it now. You've done some tremendous labor history pieces, which I've totally borrowed, stolen <laughs> for, for the Labor History Podcast. And then out of that came, and you see this behind me, the Labor Radio Podcast Weekly, which frankly, I don't think would exist if it wasn't for your work, because this is, we now have 70 shows, and so just trying to pull, it's a selection that, that we choose to really highlight some of these wonderful shows because as you, just from going through all these shows, the, the amount of just fabulous content that folks are putting out, it just, we've been doing it for like six months now and every week I'm amazed. Every week I'm just, I could literally not do another of my own shows and just, and just use content from the other labor shows, which is pretty cool. I came across the network uh, through an introduction from Bama Athria and she does the gig podcast and right. uh, gave some feedback as she was developing that and joined the network in June. And mm -hmm. it's some of the, the greatest people I've, I've ever met. So I, I feel so humble and so much gratitude and, and be, feel very fortunate to uh, have come across you. And so anyone who is doing labor, radio and podcasts please check out the labor radio podcast network and join us and even if you're not doing it there's something for everyone so everyone should take a look at it well and you you mentioned something that i think is worth underlining which is the generosity of spirit among these folks is just amazing i mean somebody gets a good guest, they share it with everybody else. They get good content or people having some sort of technical problem. That's to me been the greatest thing about the network is especially like as we all moved into having to do shows remotely, it was really great to have all of that. People, first of all, just to know that like I wasn't the only one dealing with how do I do recording in a home studio, right? So just some real technical kinds of things to have that kind of of, of access was really good but i really look forward to those weekly meetings and, and there's a solidarity which is what the labor movement is all about to realizing because because those of us who are doing labor radio and podcasts there's more of us than you think right i mean like i said when i started out i kind of scraped together 20 of us and i thought that was pretty much it and the fact that we have over 70 six months later it's mind-boggling it's absolutely mind-boggling and international and really, as well 
And that's right, we have some in Brazil, we have some in the UK and in Canada. But you had asked about the vision going forward. And look, whatever happens next month with the election, even if Biden wins or even when Biden wins, our work is not going to be done. In some ways, it's probably going to just have begun. So I feel like the network, the timing on the network could not be better. If we have 100 or 200 labor-themed shows around the world who are sharing guests and sharing content and are able, if some issue hits, for example, to really focus and, and, and share content, I think that is going to be huge. And I think we're already starting to see movers and shakers when they come, they come to me and I'm like, oh, by the way, you can not only be on my show, but I got 70 other shows across the country that we can, we can, we can let them know you're available, right? That's huge. That's huge. So, and especially as these shows and these podcasts grow in popularity, I think it's going to become even more and more important for, for our movement and for the future of the movement. Looking into the future of organized labor, where do you see opportunity and hope? Well, I'm just, I'm going to address it from the Labor Radio Podcast Network. I've, I've never really been that interested in, 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 in policy because there are people who are much better at that and that's their job, right? But you can have the best policy in the world or you can have the best legislation in the world. But if you're not communicating with your rank and file, if you're not communicating with the public, if you're not communicating with the movement, you got a problem. And, and honestly, a lot of times communications and in the labor movement is kind of thought of last, if at all. And so I'm a big believer in, in getting our message out to the mass media and to the, to the regular media. That's absolutely important. But again, thanks to technology, we now have the ability to do our own media, whether it's podcasts or radio shows, YouTube streams. And the, frankly, this is one thing I think that the right wing has been very effective at over the last 40, 50 years, thanks to right wing talk radio. They've developed their hosts. They've developed people who can, politicians who came up, frankly, through their rank and file. We need to do more of that in the labor movement so that somebody who wants to run for office can come on a Your Rights at Work show and do an interview and then go and do a, a regular media. So we, we need to do that and we need to develop our own shows, our own platforms, larger and larger. And then the sponsors, the advertisers, everything else follows that. So this is not a a one-year thing. This is a 5, 10, 15-year thing that we have to look at. And, and again, like to me, the fact that this network went from 20 members who really were very loosely <laughs> existed basically as a list to something where we are meeting every week and we're actually doing a lot of stuff together, you know, in basically six months, this is moving much, much faster than, than I thought. And so I think that that's a function of both of an accent of te technology, the pandemic, but also the time that we're in. The times that we're in call for this, uh, and, and it's a necessary thing. Chris Garlock, thank you for everything you, you're doing, and we look forward to taking a look at your shows.